What is going on YouTube? I uh, Andrew Miller, editor over at HookemHeadlines.com. Coming back at you today with uh, one of probably will be multiple videos um, coming today or early tomorrow. Um, we should have either Tarek or Shane or both, also from Hook'em Headlines, uh, joining joining me again either later tonight or tomorrow for recording. We're talking right now Big 12 Championship game uh, reaction. I'm going to get into a little bit for like, I mean, we're a Texas specific channel, so I'm going to get into a little bit like scenarios for Texas at this point. But right now, it's this entire situation with the playoff and with some of the upper tier bowl games are, it's so in flux that there's so much that can happen. Um, and I, I'm going to get my initial reactions to the game and then talk a little bit more about scenarios and things like that. So Big 12 title game. First of all, wild game. Uh, TCU ends up fighting back uh, to force overtime against Kansas State. Kansas State ends up hitting a field goal uh, to take the 31-28 or 31-28 win. One of the big, big moments of this game in overtime. Uh, Kansas State stuffs Kentra Miller and the Frogs on the goal line. At that point, all they need is any sort of points to win the game, and they end up getting down to about the 10-12 yard line, knocking through a. Not a chip shot, but a pretty easy field goal to grab a three-point win. Um, this game was this game was weird. It was wild. It was hard to get a read on. Um, I'm going to give a couple takes just on the overarching picture of the Big 12 right now. For one, congrats to Kansas State. They've had a good season. A weird season, absolutely, but a good season. Congrats to TCU. They've had a good season. I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the game before we get into the elephant in the room of, like, the playoff conversation. So, the game itself, it you know, I, I really thought that it was going to be a little bit more of a high-scoring game than we saw. Uh, you know, we end up with a little over 50 points in regulation. Um, I believe, yeah, 59 points in total. And so, it's... It was more of a defensive struggle than I thought it was going to be, and credit to both defenses, but, you know, you, you, you never really saw any portion of either passing game really getting in a consistent rhythm. Kansas State had some chunk plays, um, especially, like, first, third quarter, they were looking pretty good, but uh, Deuce Vaughn was the majority of Kansas State's offense for sure, especially down the stretch. Um, he, was, he was awesome in this one, as he is most games. Um, and then on the TCU side, it, the running game was on and off, but Duggan was getting just just pounded out there. He was whether it was the whether it was the pass rush, running quarterback power, which I will say, at least in the first half and some of the second, I wasn't a huge fan of. Especially once it, it was clear that K State was winning the line of scrimmage on a lot of these plays, getting a read on it early. That you know Duggan's a little bit banged up. I don't know why. TCU was running so much quarterback power. Um, you've got enough weapons to where I think you've got other options there and you're not kind of putting your quarterback's health on the line in such a big game with so much on the line. Yeah, again, so much on the line. Um, but I, I'll pull up the I'll pull up some of the numbers here just to give a quick rundown. So Duggan does finish with 200, a little over 250 passing yards, one touchdown, one pick, probably two other balls that he also could have been picked when dropped by uh, K-State DB. Um, he, the main contributions from Duggan, though, was a little over 100 rushing yards, one touchdown, including, like, say 90 yards, 90 rushing yards on that last drive in regulation for TC release, the last score and drive regulation, where Duggan was just, he just wouldn't be denied. Um, I think that was extremely impressive, something that probably locks in his Heisman finalist status. Um, and then on the Kansas State side, Will Howard was pretty good, uh, a little under 200 passing yards, two touchdowns. Not many big mistakes from Will Howard in this game either, but it was chunk plays and the ground game. They kind of kept Kansas State going in this one. Deuce Vaughn finishes 160 total yards, 130 of which were rushing. Uh, 100, yeah, like I said, 130 rushing yards, five yards per carry, one touchdown. A lot of those yards came on a 44-yard run, and I believe that was in the second half, and down the stretch, he was, he was just solid, man. Um, I don't know who you would hand the MVP to in this game, offensively at least. But 
I mean, if you're just going with the winning team here, you pretty much have to give it to Vaughn. But also, I mean, Malik Knowles, at least in the first half, was really big for Kansas State. Only had three touches offensively, but went for nearly 100 yards on that. Unfortunately, that he came up injured uh, in the first half, especially playing so close to home. But, I mean, it was the defenses that mainly kind of bowed up at the key points in this game outside of TCU's late drive. Um, you know, TCU somehow 470 total yards of offense, but just 28 points. Lack of conversions in the red zone, some on time, one on time, one untimely turnover from the first half when dug in through a jump ball that was way underthrown to uh, Quentin Johnston had some pressure coming up in his face. But I mean, Kansas State had pressure in Duggan's face all day. Um, he was not comfortable in the pocket to say the very least. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was an interesting game. It was a dogfight. It was a real battle. Um, I mean, you can see that by just the score that came about in the fourth quarter that, you know, TCU ends up winning at 11-7 to that forces it to overtime. And then, again, K-State's goal line stand was the difference maker when it came down to it. And so, uh, yeah, I, that's pretty much all I have for the game itself because, again, there's not – oh, there wasn't a ton good, at least offensively, to dig into. And, again, we're a Texas show, so I'd like to take just more of an overarching look at the postseason. So – I mean, the elephant in the room is TCU's playoff status, I think. Like, what happens with with TCU? They're now 12-1. and one. I personally think since this game goes into overtime, and with USC losing yesterday, that TCU should still be in. Um, but there's going to be some interesting arguments. I do want to say this first, because I'll end up doing a piece on it. I don't know exactly how their model looks, or looks at this, but it was really interesting to me to see that 538, their model for the playoff predictions, now has Kansas State with like a 39% chance of getting in. Utah with like somewhere in the ballpark, like 24 to 27%. I mean, those are two, three loss teams. Yes, they're Power 5 Conference champions. Yes, they beat some good teams that were figured to be in the playoff otherwise, and TCU and USC, but... Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not putting in a three loss Kansas state. I'm not putting in a three loss Utah. If they had two losses, they're in the conversation. Sure. But it, they're probably in. That's just kind of chaotic year. It's, it's been for the playoff conversation, but with three losses, I think you've got to include a two loss Alabama or a one loss Ohio state over them. i um, also a one loss TCU still. If TCU had lost this game by like 20, even double digits, I, I think that it's more of a valid conversation that they could be left out of the playoff because if you're losing to Kansas State like that, how are you going to do against a team like Georgia or Michigan? But, you know, we still got a few title games to be decided, so I, I can't say anything there for sure. But I think right now you still have to include TCU and Ohio State as your two more teams in the playoff, assuming Georgia and Michigan win their respective title games today. Um. Kansas State, I think, is you can pretty much lock them into the Sugar Bowl with the Big 12 title, and I mean that's huge for them. But it's I, I don't I don't even think that if I were K State that I would really want to be in the playoff. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, me and Tark were talking about this a little bit earlier, and um, I mean, I guess if you're selected for the playoff, you're going to the playoff. I don't really know. I mean, I'm sure you can turn it down in some way, but I, I think if you're selected, you're going. I don't know. I don't know what route kind of leads to K-State in the playoff. Um, my assumption would be that, you know, you get probably just more chaos. Because here's the thing. If LSU ends up being, beating Georgia, and I know I'm doing a lot of speculation here, but um, we have a lot of unknowns right now. If LSU beats Georgia, I'm probably putting in a three-loss LSU that has wins over Georgia and Alabama over a three-loss Kansas State, or even a three-loss Utah, for that matter. So I don't, I don't know what the thinking is necessarily there um, in that like in that route of chaos, but then you also have the possibility that, slight possibility at least, that Michigan loses to Purdue. Purdue's a tough team. Is it out of the question? No, but obviously unlikely. Michigan's more than a two-touchdown favorite. And they looked really good against Ohio State on the road. Right. So we'll see. Maybe more chaos happens there. I think that's the most likely route, though, is if you just get some very friendly selection committee members to um, either K-State or Utah, and that they're like, you know what, it's so much chaos that we're just going to pick the 
teams that like kind of the what have you done for me lately kind of looking at through that lens you know what which teams are hot coming into the postseason but I think I, I guess if you're a Kansas State fan that's kind of what you're rooting for is for Michigan to lose because if Michigan ends up if Michigan ends up losing to Purdue that also looks bad for Ohio State because they just got blown out by Michigan last week um and so I think I think if you're the three loss power five champions and you're actually hoping to get into the playoff here, I think Utah, I, I will say this, I think Utah actually has a better argument than Kansas State because the way they beat uh, USC yesterday was thoroughly impressive. I know that Caleb Williams was injured and the USC just got really banged up in that game, especially on offense. But the way that Utah looked with an injured Cam rising coming into the game, that you have to give them the credit there over Kansas State, who barely, like, it was, like, inches from lo- from potentially losing this game. So, and they've already lost to TCU once this season, whereas Utah beat USC twice. I think that, I think that conversation favors Utah. But, man, it's, I don't know. I, I have a hard time seeing how TCU doesn't get in the playoff at this point. I, I, I could see it happening, but, I mean, there would have to be some sort of chaos in TCU once again getting snubbed as they did in 2014. This would obviously be different, but, um, I mean, they're a one-loss team. They were so close that this game was pretty much a coin flip. So, you know, you give Max Duggan, Quentin Johnston, Kendra Miller, some of these guys that have been banged up lately a month to recover, they're going to be a little bit more formidable. Whereas, like, I think Kansas State, yeah, they have some injuries, but, like, Will Howard was healthy, Deuce Vaughn was healthy. A lot of their key guys were pretty... And DK Uzoma, like it, a lot of their key guys on each side of the ball were were healthy. Not all. Again, I know they had some DB injuries in this game. Malik Knowles exited, so like still some key players, but the most important were there. So this leads me to kind of my conclusion here, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. But I, you know, we're at a chaotic point in the day, so I'll, I'll give my take as of now. Um, it, I don't know if it's just going to be me and Tarek or me, Tarek and Shane, but some former combination of us again either reporting tonight or tomorrow we'll be coming at you with all of our thoughts and you know as kind of chaos winds down today whatever may happen in the remaining title games see where texas falls in this and kind of how the playoff is coming together um as of right now texas still technically could land in the cheese it bowl but like I think they're as locked into the Alamo Bowl as I figured they would be a few days ago. Again, Kansas State's pretty much a lock for the Sugar Bowl, I think. And I still think TCU is very likely going to be in the playoff field. At that point, that leaves Texas with the Alamo Bowl. Because even if TCU doesn't make the playoff, then they're probably an at-large in the New Year's Six. I believe that would place them in the Cotton Bowl. I would need to explore more of the scenarios there. But I, it's really hard to find a way that TCU isn't – like, the TCU lands in the Alamo Bowl. I don't know 100%. I, I'm, I'm sure there's a way that happens, but the level of snub the TC would have to be to get there would be pretty incredible. So, again, I'm thinking right now Texas Alamo Bowl, but we'll see. I mean, I don't know. There's It, it is the Alamo or the cheez Bowl, and it, it, a lot of that just hangs in the balance of what happens with TCU. And I guess technically... There is still a chance that Kansas State could sneak their way into the playoff, and I can't really believe that I'm saying that, but there's some models giving them a chance, so um, I, I will respect that. But anyway, um, I, that's pretty much it for this video. I want to, again, wanted to get my quick wrap up here. We've done a little bit of coverage over the site for the Big 12 title game, and we'll continue to do so, so I'll link up some of that work in the description below. But anyway, uh, for Andrew Miller, I put my headlines. That is pretty much it.